<clears throat> well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our in St. Augustine Bible study. I'm Father Patrick Smith, pastor here at St. Augustine Catholic Church in D.C., and uh, we're studying the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, and uh, one of we, as always, will begin with the prayer, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for all your many blessings, Lord, um, as we delve into uh, the, it's, it's the spiritual gifts. During this Easter season, Lord, uh, continue to um, <clears throat> inspire us to uh, and empower us to go forth to share the good news, as we know the Lord will accompany us and uh, confirm our words uh, with his signs and wonders. Uh, Lord, um, as, as we uh, gather together, open our, our ears to your voice, our minds to your wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and our hearts to your love and mercy that we might go forth and share generously uh, what you have so abundantly given us as we share again generously with others through Christ our Lord. Okay, so we uh, are in uh, chapter 12, um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, we, we, the, the, the chapter is, again, entitled the spiritual gifts, and uh, someone reminded me that, you know, that we just recently had the call and gifted workshop, and it really is very much related, this, this chapter is, uh, again, we look at the different many gifts, many gifts from the one spirit, um, and uh so we uh, looked at the beginning part of uh, up to uh, verse one to eleven, um, which really just talked about just a couple highlights of, um, uh, to uh, you know how the again the, the that it says in verse twelve three. Therefore, I want to understand that you understand that no one can, no one speaking by the Spirit of God can ever say Jesus be cursed, and no one can even say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it just reminds us that. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the, uh, again, it's like the, you know, the animator of the church. It's, it's, we'll see even later. It's like the soul, you know, soul without a body is just a corpse. Uh, a church without the spirit is just a lifeless body. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, when even when Jesus died, you know, what did he say on the cross? You know, uh, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. You know, spirit left his body. The result is death. That's always the case. Um, and, um, uh, but God is also in the restoration business. Think about the story of Adam. When God created Adam, the one of the creation stories says he made Adam out of clay of the earth, formed, you know, the perfect human body, but it was just a lifeless body. And then it says he breathed into his nostrils and Adam went from a lifeless body to a living being. Okay. And so similarly, you know, the idea of, uh, even as we celebrate this Sunday, mm -hmm. the feast of Pentecost. You know, the spirit came upon that community. And that's why Jesus even said, you know, wait, you know, uh, wait, you know, pray in the upper room, wait for the promise of the father, the promise of the spirit before you even begin trying to do the work of the church. Wait for the Holy Spirit, because without the spirit, there is no Christian life. Um, there's no work of God continuing. You know, Jesus, the main title of Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah, which means anointed one. You know, he as a human being, again, he shows us how do you live under the influence of the Holy Spirit, okay? And it's precisely people knew the Spirit of God was at work through him because of the impact of the things that he, you know, that they saw things that only God can do, you know, raise the dead, calm the storms, uh, um, make the crippled walk, you know, that you know, bring, make the deaf hear, you know, walk on the water. It's like... Um, so really the crystal, so if the word Christian, if Christ means anointed ones, then Christian means share is in Christ's anointing, share is in the anointing. Um, so again, there's no living the Christian life without uh, the, the, uh, the supernatural presence of God, you know, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that first part from one to 10, it just, it talks, speaks about how, again, that how God, there are a variety of gifts, you know, it's like, uh, Someone told me a long time ago that one image, you know, it's like, you know, well, it's like Santa Claus, you know, if, if you see if Santa Claus shows up, you expect them to have lots of gifts. So, well, we have something better than Santa Claus, you know, it's uh, St. Nick, it's, uh, it's the Holy Spirit, shows up with gifts um, for the church, for the community, that we might put those gifts into, into action to carry out the work of God. Okay, so just think of just, uh, and so that one verse I read about, you know, uh, first one, it says, no one 
uh, no one speaking by the Spirit of God can say, curse be Jesus, meaning, you know, God is Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God does not contradict himself. God doesn't, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, that uh, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ and the Father. You know, Jesus spoke of the Father. Um, the Father speaks of the Son. This is my Son. Listen to him, you know, and, and the um, uh, transfiguration, uh, you know, that uh, and it's like, and so it's a, the love of the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. So from it's like, so you see this trinity of persons, um, but equal in, equal in majesty, we say, you know, God is a trinity of persons, but equal in majesty, three persons, one God, because God is perfect love, you know, perfect love can make, you know, so we talk about like, you know, I have one family. You know, or two shall become one. The idea is that, um, you know, the, the, my, yeah, I mentioned my family, you know, you know, eight siblings, two parents. It's like, you know, we have something in common, you know, but we're one family. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but uh, the other thing is that also a reminder that to see how dependent we are on the Holy Spirit to do the work of the church, um, this, it says that you can't even say, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, technically anyone could talk and say those words, but no one can truly profess it, you know, um, sincerely say it and or believe it. Remember, you know, at, at mass when we say the creed, you know, after the homily, say, let us profess our faith. And there's this long creed. Well, the first creed of the early church was three words. Jesus is Lord. That's, the, you know, that, that their profession of faith. They didn't see Jesus as simply the leader of this new religion. Uh, you know, it's not uh, like you know Buddha, well, you know, you know, with Buddhism or Islam and and uh, um, you know Muhammad. Uh, it's like you no, know, Jesus wasn't just a founder of religion, a, 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 a person chosen by God. But it's like what was what was uniquely stood out about the Christians was they didn't just honor their leader, they didn't just acknowledge their leader. They worship their leader. And it's like, wait a minute, the first commandment, have no other gods before me. And they're like, yeah, we, we agree with that. But because <clears throat> clearly, if you look at the scriptures, we see where Jesus, you know, clearly demonstrated he's equal to the Father. You know, um, you know, so Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You don't get it. You know, I will send another advocate, the spirit of truth. So it's precisely the equality of, you know, so if you think of, uh, again, even the, the longer creed, you know, we believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You look and break the creed, it's like we believe, we believe in God the Father Almighty. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord, the giver of life. And there's you know, a whole paragraph with, with half of each one. But then it's like, well, who believes? We believe, you know, the church, the community. So the creed that, that captures the whole creed. You know, so when I teach it to young people, it's like, let's just start with. How do you say your prayers, Father, Son? I say, okay, you just said the creed. Um, excuse me, little allergies. Um, that uh, and it's you, you know, you the Christians of the believer of the church, who we 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 pray, we act, we serve in the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But that, okay, so um, but though again, the Holy Spirit. So when it says, so the point is, if if we can't even sincerely say the words, Jesus is Lord. Um, without the Holy Spirit, we certainly can't live the Christian life. You know, if I can't say the words, I certainly can't live the life. So keep that in mind. That's why we, as uh, again, uh, when we're looking at again the different gifts, um, and maybe we can just uh, read through. I, 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 I uh, we spoke about it, but I'm not going to uh, comment on, on it again. But um, maybe we'll just start with the beginning of twelve, just to remind ourselves. Um, uh, or maybe really verse four. Um, Actually, we'll start with verse one. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, uh, brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when when you were heathen, you were led astray to mute idols. Can't speak. However, you may have been. Ho however, you may have been moved. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts. Varieties of gifts but the same spirit. And there are variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of working, but it is the same God who inspires them all in each one. 
Um, you notice it in those verses too there that, again, he's intentionally referencing the Holy Spirit, speaking about the Spirit, Jesus, Lord, and God, again, as, as equal, you know, as, uh, you know, and God often was just the name God for, in New Testament, particularly focusing on the Father. Um, but he, again, he mentions all three, just as a reminder, a hint that, you know, again, God is Trinity. Verse seven, to each is, each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So nobody's left out. You baptize, you have been given, you know, the, again, you, you, you are, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit, the gifts that will manifest the spirit. People recognize well, the spirit is with you. Um, so it says no exceptions. It says to each, um, but also what is the reason? For the common good. God doesn't seem to give you the gifts of spirit for your own personal edification or use. You know, God's given me a, a gift and I just use it to, I don't know, make money, be popular. It's kind of like, you know, it's like uh, God gives you a gift of a voice. You know, that's not one of the gifts of the spirit, but specifically the idea that um, I can use this voice just to serve me. Maybe I'm a great singer, you know, uh, or I can use it to serve the mission. Um, use this voice to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, okay, in verse eight again, to one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, discernment. Uh, to another, to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are inspired by one and the same spirit who proportions to each one individually as he wills. So God decides who, what, what, who, what gifts um, are given. Um, I want to say one about the, yeah. The one uh, gift that you might have a question about in verse nine, it says, you know, different gifts. And it says, you know, one of the gifts it says is faith. Now, for those who attend the calling gift of workshop know that it's not just what well, doesn't all it's all disciples called to have faith, give give the gift of faith. Yeah, but this is and so the footnote mentions um uh in 12 9, it says uh when it talks about faith, not the gift of saving faith possessed by all Christians, uh, but an extraordinary trust in God that encourages others uh who witness it. An extraordinary trust in God that encourages others who witness it. So one of the most common examples of that extraordinary extraordinary gift of faith is like uh, uh, the founders of religious orders. You think about, you know, so this guy named Francis, you know, and God bless him with the gift of faith. And, and it's so struck, uh, pe people follow. They, it's like, um, it wasn't just, a, you know, in addition to the ordinary gift of faith of, and, and consent and assent to God, you know, you think, of, I mean, literally we have orders, they, you know, it's like, well, who, who, you know, where did, uh, who founded the Dominicans? St. Dominic. The Franciscans, St. Francis, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the uh, Sisters of St. Clair, you know, St. Clair. I mean, it's like different, particularly these people who stood out in an extraordinary way as, um, you know, the, uh, and that people followed. Um, that they had the charism they had been given, that, that of faith and courage and the sort of like, you know, that would they seem to shrink to nothing, to anyone or anything, even willing to die, be martyred for their faith fearless. It's like that people said, I need to, you know, I want to know, I want to listen to this person. I want to follow this person. I want to live that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and so that's what we said a lot of times, the founders of religious orders, all, almost in every case, it was a matter of one person with his assurance gift of faith was living it out, and, and it was impossible not to be noticed by others. And they're like, you know, tell us what you're doing. What are you about? And inside you join, you know, him or her. You know, to actually become, you know, followers. You know, my previous parish before St. Augustine, you know, was St. Teresa of Avila, you know, born in Spain, you know. But again, you, you read her story, just, you know, how she, uh, you know, her, as, as a reformer, she at both a mystic, you know, a woman of profound, deep, contemplative prayer, and yet also a reformer, a woman of action. And and, and, you know, and that really, Captain of Siena, I mean, just when you read those stories, uh, you start to realize, too, that they were saints for their time. It's like, you know, at a time where the church was caught up in papal states and, the, and competing with the emperor and lots of material things, it's like France is arriving, you know, 
brother poverty, you know, mm -hmm. sister, it's like, where he has nothing, you know, his whole, you know, uh, his inauguration of his ministry was, you know, uh, his father was a wealthy person who said, you know, Francis, you're going to, you know, you need to continue the family business. And he knew God was calling him to something different. So eventually, I mean, the, you know, his father's going to just lock him up, put him in, the, you know, chain him up. And then they're leaving his house, you know, and he, you know, taking off all his clothes in the middle of, of, uh, of a CC of, of the, uh, it's like, this, I, I give you everything back. You know, I'm I'm now God's son. You know, I'm a follow God. So it's like anything, and so and he did. You know, and and uh, but the idea of that kind of a radical response of like everything for God. You know, um, once a month I, I I celebrate mass with the missionaries of charity. You know, founded by Mother Teresa. Again, there was just like, you know. Um, so anyway, just often you you see often in these stories, you read the stories of these. Um, of these saints and these founders of orders that it was pretty extraordinary. I mean, you know, it wasn't just typical of everybody. Um, so if God wants somebody to do something extraordinary like that, he gives them that gift of, of extraordinary faith, okay? Um, and as it says in a footnote there again, extraordinary, an extraordinary trust in God that encourages others who witness, it. you know, um, can't miss it. All right. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, Again, of course, some of the others that mentioned you know, um, in verse 10 to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits in the discernment, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. So let's comment on that. So 1210 on uh, tongues, it says, um, uh, you know, maybe the earthly languages of men. So where did that come from? Think about it. In the Acts of the Apostles, so the Holy Spirit came upon them and there were people from all over the world and said and they were struck by how each could understand what they were saying, what they were hearing and they like, how is it possible it's like so in that case it's like they were literally speaking them various languages the people understood what they were saying which was surprised because they were from all different countries okay so um and uh and so that's one you know so it mentioned the earthly languages of men you know or the heavenly speech of angels um, and so we haven't gotten to, let's just actually mentions, uh, the next chapter. Um, uh, yeah, if you actually look at the uh, 13 verse one, yeah, if I, um, yeah, if I speak in the, in the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love, that's when we get into the love chapter. Um, uh, but the idea of, uh, you know, an extraordinary, a, 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 um, you know, a language, uh, of, uh, that's not simply of the, uh, simply a human language. Um, but in, um, as he mentions, the speech, the speech of the angels, and we'll, he, he gets more in detail about that uh, as we um, learn more about that. Um, let's see. Yeah, and of course, uh, as, as that footnote continues, uh, so again, the heavenly speech of angel, angel. But one thing I'll just say, um, the first part about the earthly languages of men. Um, Many times, especially if you think of a missionary church, going to places where the gospel has been preached, going to places and, of people who speak other languages. Um, you know, you may, you know, sometimes, you know, we're like uh, that, man, some people like seem to find learning new languages easy, you know, and other people like like me is like, you know, hey, just, you know, to struggle, you know, to, to learn another language. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there are times when uh, I've had to minister to people you know, who let's say going to a hospital and something that's uh, I don't speak they, 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 I don't speak their language, and yet I know God is really to to you were to uh, penetrate through that. It's like if he you know they whether it's the you know the, the language of simply what they see you're doing, how you communicate love, how you communicate care. I can anoint a person. I can remember a person who had a leg amputated, and for some reason whatever the condition they couldn't. They, they they couldn't give him pain medicine. I mean, that that didn't happen. When I went there, he was patched patched up. But and I remember is taking his hand, and he was clearly excruciating pain. And I remember just uh, he's grabbed my hand very tight, you know. And I found I just started tightening my hand, and literally, it's almost like you think it was, you know, like. But I remember I was squeezing as hard as I could to just let so him know he's not alone. He was squeezing me, and I was squeezing him like I feel you. You know, and it's like he's holding on to me, and I'm holding on to him. And you know, I um, but many times just trusting that God, if God wants His love, He wants a message communicated. 
um, you know, and that's some there's some miracles of talking about people who who actually again went were able to uh, again speak other languages um, because that's what was needed, you know. So um, so again with Pentecost we celebrate Sunday. It was you know the people from all around were surprised that they could actually understand what the apostles were saying, you know. And uh, so um, so I'll say that that's just not that's even practically in uh, when it comes to you know, how God equips his church to do the work he wants done. Okay, yeah, yeah. Not emphasize speaking in tongues. No yeah. uh, I, I was uh, actually, we're coming up to that because <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll actually, if I, the, the question really should be, why does St. Paul not emphasize the, the speaking of tongues like the Pentecostals do? <laughs> You know, so and you'll see because he's he's going to get a whole section of of the he specifically says he avoids speaking. It's not something wrong because at the time people were making such a it they was they were giving too much uh, attention to it. They said there are other gifts and uh, that are far more important. You know, especially if you're speaking language this angelic language that if no one can understand, remember at Pentecost it's like they were struck by they could understand. But when speaking like, so it's like, and that's why this one of the gifts is also is interpretation of time, you know, because in the end, um, so I think that in a dim, different uh, tradition, again, there's sort of like that almost it was speaking in tongues, like some Pentecostal um, it would be almost, it was almost like that is, you know, the, the, the um, what's, what's the uh, term, um, you know, the main sign that, you know, you have the Holy Spirit. You know, um, the main barometer, you know, so if you're not speaking in tongues, you could, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's like, so, uh, and it will see, the, so sometimes, uh, so anyway, but that's, uh, but, but Paul actually addresses that of uh, um, why he's to have a certain balance. Um, but actually what we do, and actually this question was asked in the Bible study, uh, but for those who are present, one person is like, um, the idea that there's no question that the Holy Spirit does manifest in the speaking of tongues. It's like something called a prayer language, you know, oftentimes like in the context of worship, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, if you all, sometimes like uh, prayer groups or prayers by the prayer groups, maybe everyone's praying. Maybe there's a song and everyone's after the words, you know, people are just the song is still on and people just start praying out loud. And sometimes and it's just a, the experience of, of, um, uh, just, you know, just, um, again, you're praying and then there's, you're saying things that that's like, it's not a normal language. You just, and sort of, um, you know, so anyway, but that's, that, that is something that's, it's not something that the Catholic church, you know, frowns on or says, well, that's, that's no longer valid. It is. And there many, especially, uh, I guess I forgot what it was, was in the seventies or the sixties when the charismatic movement in the United States, there was a period of time where it just was kind of an explosion of, the charismatic movement, the idea of the you know uh, Holy Spirit, uh, just move, you know, really inspiring people to just uh, uh, to really to this to living out the charisms and particularly uh, in, in worshiping in this unique way, the praise. So oftentimes today you, you see speaking in tongues, it's, it's in the context of worship uh, and uh, ec you know, ecstatic praise, um, and. Uh, Rarely do you hear the idea of someone says, well, uh, well you know, let's say in a group, and it's like, well, someone just says something in, in a, a language that no one understands. And it's like, okay, what? You know, it's like, you know, I have no, no one here knows what you said. You know? And so the idea is that sometimes we, we talk about the interpretation of times. That somebody, if there's no interpretation, then it is, it is more of me expressing this, you know, that the, the manifestation of spirit in me it is literally no help to you because you don't know what I'm saying. You know, so it's like if I have a message and it comes and I speak it that way, it's like, unless there's someone there to interpret it, then it's just, some, and, and actually we'll get to that because Paul explicitly says exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's even so, people start speaking in tongues and they're yeah. just so you don't know what they're saying, you don't know what, you know, what what's going on, what are they, Right. Well, I think now again, I've been in, in prayer meetings, and first of all, if it's in worship, it's it's it, it's praise. It's it's not so much a message to you. It's you know, and so it's not like if you're like you know, praise you God, we love you Lord, we praise you. It's like, oh, what are you saying? It's like you know, now you don't stop praying. Say, I don't, I don't want to say what you're saying. It's like you don't care. I mean, I mean, point if when you are when you truly allow 
I mean, just you can think of any moments. Sometimes, you know, you know, once in a while we've had, you know, maybe there's a song we sing in church, or it can be someone in the congregation or a member of the choir who's just like, the song's done, but they're still praising. They're still going. It's kind of like, and it's not, you know, it, and it's, um, um, you know, and so it's kind of like, it, it's, it's similar. I mean, you think even just on the human level, when we get very, very excited and it's kind of like, you know, people shout, they're not talking. It's like, you know, you know, we, you know, it's, uh, you know, woo -woo, whatever you just, you're making noises, which is as expression of what you are feeling, what you're not, that's not tongues, by the way, that's what I'm saying, but on a spiritual level, you know, there's, you know, where you can be, as they say, caught up in the spirit, in a, a spirit of, you know, even I mentioned earlier, Ter Teresa of Avila, you know, that actually, and again, I'm just, I've never heard of any writing for her speaking in tongues, but She's had these, you know, moments of concept of ecstatic, of ecstasy, you know, of just where it wasn't about words. It was just, it was simply like being so caught up in God and like just letting God, um, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I think even um, St. Paul talks about, you know, and, and about being caught up in the spirit of like, uh, and um, so anyway, but I think, but so, but I think it's um, when you are in the prayer, I've been in progress where people just praising, um, some of you speaking in tongues, it's not, and, and it never crossed my like, I wonder what they're saying. I wonder what they're, you know, it's more of like, I know what they're doing. We are praising God. God is, God is beyond words. You know, no language can contain. It. And, you know, we can't say, well, let me just explain everything there is to know about God. So there, I'm done. It's like, no, you you can't. God is the ocean with no bottom. Okay. But the idea of, uh, but I think that, you know, but also think about, um, like the death of Stephen, you know, in the Acts of the Apostles, he's the first apostle that's, that's killed. And while they are yelling, it says they're yelling at him, you know, the, those vicious words, vitriolic words and everything. And it says, he's look at, his face was like an angel, perfect peace. You know, it's like caught up in God. It's like, not even, it's like totally unfaithful, you know? And it's like, this, people are raging at him. And it's like, and so often you see, uh, I mean, just oftentimes you hear some of the stories of the martyrs who, you know, even in the scriptures, you know, the, uh, I forgot the, uh, uh, the woman and her, was it seven sons, whatever, but it's like, but they're like, they're, they're totally fearless. Okay. Mm -hmm. That gives the Holy Spirit. When it gives the Spirit, fortitude, you know, joy. And it's like, you know, what did Jesus say? You know, I, um, that, uh, I tell you this so that you may, um, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be there's even a passage where it says Jesus, after the 72 come back, you know, and it said Jesus is just exclaiming, you know, I give you thanks, I give you praise, Father, you know, for what he's what he's doing in the lives of the apostles. So, so anyway, but I, I, I'll, I'll keep going, but we'll because there'll be more about tongues, um, and even in the passage we're doing today. Um, okay, um, but we'll also look at the second part of the footnote where it talks about again tongues 12:10. It says the gift of interpretation is the complement of the gift of tongues, mm -hmm. enabling unintelligible utterances to be understood by the assembled community. Okay, again, he gets you getting that in the chapter 14. Okay, um, 12, 13, again, by, uh, so uh, he mentions by, um, yeah, let's actually, we'll continue. Verse, um, verse 12, but just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are, are one body, so it is with Christ. Let me just read that again. Just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Uh, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am an out of hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would, where would, be, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the organs in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single organ, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. 
The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body would seem to be weaker or indispensable and those parts of the body, which we think less honorable, we invest with the greater, um, I'm sorry, let me read that again, 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body which, we, which seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body which we think less honorable, we invest with the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our, which, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior part, that there may be no discord in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Okay, we'll stop there in this um, resume at 27. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Um, if we can just read the footnote on 1213. Um, again, uh, by one spirit. That is the divine action of the spirit working in baptism. Um, so again, it was uh, the body, uh, just as um, the thing 13 said, uh, for by one spirit, we were baptized into one body. Um, and so it says again, that is by the divine action of the spirit working in baptism. One body. This is not simply a metaphor for the church with the focus on her organizational unity but it expresses the metaphysical reality that every believer is truly united with Christ by the sacraments. Um, let me uh, actually, um, so just again, met metaphysical, met again, think of this physical physics. Meta means it's like, uh, this really, uh, I think it comes from Aristotle. Um, metaphysics is a study of reality, of existence, of the meaning or purpose of a thing. So it's kind of like, okay, you see the thing physically, but is there a deeper meaning, you know? And so when you talk about, you know, you, what is your purpose? You know, what is it, the meaning of your existence? Why are you here? You know, what is, so it's like, um, uh, you know, it's like you, you are, you are, for example, you and I are more than just a walking body. Okay. So let's say, uh, you know, a, a, a coroner could do an autopsy and it's just a body. And he's just looking at you know, this physical body. But before, you know, as a living being, it's like you, you can't, you're more complicated. Than that. So well, I see just a body, but it's like, there's so much more to you. What is, again, it's, and again, we, we ask things not just like, what am I, but like, why am I, you know? Um, and then who am I? So we, so for example, we believe that as a human being, you are body and soul. So again, there's more to me, it's not just the, the physical presence. There's something much deeper. What is it? So, but, um, you know, in metaphysics, you're always looking, what is the deeper meaning of this? You know, it's not just, um, uh, and I think in a certain way, we naturally at some point in our lives start to look at ourselves that way and say, what's this got to be, you know, in a society that is so um, consumed with um, like the physical appearance, and the physical body, you know, billion, multi-billion dollar industry is, you know, with the cosmetic industry or, you know, uh, physical changes, everything. It's like, um, it's like the focus on, you know, how do I make myself more beautiful? Or how do I, and yet, or opposite, it's like, okay, if you, Person goes to war and loses an arm and a leg. Are they less of a person? The reality says no. Um, so it's like there's got there's more to you than just your body. Um, so and so what he's saying in this context, he's saying that first of all, when the, when Paul says um, we are one body, it's not just um, just a metaphor, as he kind of you know because he talks about how, how the physical body is, but it says, but it's more, it's not just meta, a metaphor, but a metaphysical reality that every believer is truly united with Christ. Um, not just analogously or symbolically, the idea that we are connected. Um, and that we know, and again, why would Paul, what, where would Paul even get this idea? I always go back to Paul's conversion. Um, he was, Saul was persecuting the community of believers. And when he had this moment of, you know, being knocked off his horse, a flash of light, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, you know, so when Jesus, it's not just symbolic, it's like someone, when you are attacking my followers, you're actually persecuting me. So it is, you know, the mystery of, you know, in fact, one of the names of the church, we call the, the church is the mystical body of Christ. 
um, there is a mystery, just like the Eucharist. Our eyes see, you know, the naked eye, we see, we see bread and wine, but it's like there's more, okay? How we encounter you know, the, the actual body and blood of Christ. Well, we may see, okay, we're a group of people in church, you know, like, could we be just like any group that, you know, gathers in a hall for a town hall meeting, you know, packed house, a bunch of people in a, in a hall. It says, no, church is more than that. Not just a bunch of bodies, living, living people gathered together. But when we kind of gather together in faith, what did Jesus say? When two or three are gathered in my name, I am present. Uh, and that unique, I am present in your midst. Again, this is not just, you know, it's, it's not just empty language. It's not just a symbolic language. He's truly present with us. Okay, we share in his body. Um, at the confirmation last Saturday, one of the things that Bishop uh, said to the kids, he, he said, uh, uh, look at your hands. Kind of like, yeah, look at your hands. And I said, hey, you see your hands? Okay. Those are Jesus' hands. They're like, you know, you're a member of the body of Christ. You're now being confirmed. That just like, no, those hands don't belong to you. They belong to Jesus. Now, let him use your hands to feed somebody, you know, to help somebody. You know, now look at your feet. You know, those are Jesus' feet. It was a great way of just kind of making him stop and think. Yeah, I have this body. And it's like, my body. He said, well, no, as a person baptized, consecrated, you know, uh, you belong to Christ. And so let him, you know, let him use your hands. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, actually, I jumped at that. He actually used the term. I, and in the footnote, every believer is truly united with Christ by the sacraments. The spirit is the soul of the mystical body. Um, okay. Um, I meant to, okay, we'll keep going. Uh, and then it talks about, again, uh, you know, Jews or Greeks. Union with Christ makes ethnic and social distinctions irrelevant in the eyes of God. Um, union with Christ makes ethnic and social distinctions irrelevant in the eyes of God. Um, it doesn't say there aren't, F F there aren't distinctions, but in, in the long run, the idea is that it's not the idea that uh, being a member of Christ, you know, the, uh, of uh, that it's not because we tend to make, okay, the, where the differences become an obstacle to unity um, versus and, and um, where rather than, because um, you know, you can have, you know, unity and great diversity. I did, you know, but, uh, but if, if my even identity, my uh, national identity, my cultural identity, my ethnic identity, if it trumps Christ, then that's gonna be a problem. You know, it's like nothing above him. It's like, you know, because the reality is that the incarnation, meaning God becoming a human being, uh, in a sense that Christianity and the gospel are relevant to every culture uh, and has a message for every culture. And the apostles were told, go out, go to every nation, okay? No, 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 uh, respect of persons, like every nation. Jesus, God's the love of the world. He said Jesus for every nation. Um, and so, um, but one of the things that's some part of the idea of uh, sometimes where different points in history where the church confused colonialism with evangelization it's like when that's just to bring christ to every nation we're going to bring all of our you know european customs to to this nation and say you have to adopt all of that it's like no the reality is that the gospel of christ in a sense affirms everything truly good good and true in every culture and challenges anything that's less than true and good in every culture okay so there's no like one ethnic group one culture that represents christ uh, you know, uh, that 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 uniquely and, and with the other stone. Okay. Um, but uh, it, yeah, there was going to just uh, Galatians 3, it mentions uh, Galatians 3 28. That. Yeah, that was uh, one of the footnotes, uh, one of the uh, scripture references. It's similar to what's uh, so Galatians 3 28. Um, It's a, for all of you uh, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with, uh, with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free person. There is not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to a promise. Again, it doesn't deny distinction, but it says that we tend to use our distinctions to 
to divide. Um, this is so with all of our distinctions in the end, it's like one in Christ. Um, that you know that our faith in Christ, our belief in Christ, our life in Christ trumps everything else. Um, again, we said there is no Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so that's our focus. Um, and uh, but in matter of fact, the way he describes the church as the body, you know, again, we, when it gets to you know. Uh, if one says, well, if I'm not the, if you're the ear, the, you know, if, uh, so it's like, we have, you know, there's an ear, there's an eye, there's a foot. It's like, so we, but one body. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, but actually I was going to also look at the, uh, catechism there. 12, 1267. 1267. Yeah. So that's, uh, this is in the catechism, um, uh, paragraph 1267. It says, um, yeah, baptism, really 67 and 68. Baptism makes us members of the body of Christ. Therefore, we are members, uh, uh, we are members of, of one, we are members one of another. Baptism incorporates us into the church. From the baptismal fonts, fonts is born the people of God, of the new covenant which transcends all the natural or human limits of nations, cultures, races, sexes. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And in 1268, it says, the baptized have become living stones to be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood. Um, by you know, living stones, it's like, you, know, you think of you, you build a building with many different, with many stones. It's like, so uh, that's uh, actually uh 73 that's um 73 that verse is from uh again first peter first peter the idea of living being uh, being built to a spiritual house living stones to be a holy priesthood by baptism they share in the priesthood of christ in his prophetic and royal mission they are a quote chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation god's own people that they may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Baptism gives a share in the common priesthood of all believers. Priesthood, mission. So the idea that, you know, that <clears throat> uh, all, you know, God's own people, all who declare, the, who know we are here to declare the wonderful works of him who called us out of darkness into his more, 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 uh, marvelous light. So again, that, that ultimately, um, we all in agreement that that's, that's, that's the story that matters most. Um, and um, okay. All right. Um, okay. <clears throat> just uh, again, maybe just continuing that. Um, yeah, with the footnote there. Uh, yeah, it mentions out uh, to drink of one spirit. Uh, it says baptism uh, renews and refreshes us through the spirit as does the spiritual drink of the Eucharist, of the Eucharist. Um, Baptist renews, okay. Um, yeah, because it was actually, uh, let's see. Yeah, it actually referred to that, one of the things referred to is 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And it's worth looking because just a reminder. Because here it's talking about drinking, you know, we drink of the one spirit. And there are other passages too, like the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. But here's, uh, remember in, in Corinthians um uh, uh, ten four. It said, um, um, "Let's see. Can you find it." Yeah. Well, first, before it talks about how um, how again they passed through the sea and all were baptized in Moses uh, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same supernatural food. So the Old Testament the supernatural food, the manna from heaven, and uh, and drank the same supernatural drink. You know, the water from the rock. But they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them. And the rock was Christ. Okay. Um, so the rock was so the idea of this supernatural drink. So when he talks about ultimately it's fulfilled in uh in both the you know the the Holy Spirit and the Eucharist. Um, um you know, take this and drink of it. This is the cup of my blood. But also again, the idea of um again to drink of one spirit, you know, baptism renews and refreshes us through the spirit as does the spiritual drink of the Eucharist. Okay. So again, um, 
just looking at just uh, uh, we, as we just read through 14 to 26. Uh, yeah. Um, let's just look at the footnote of that. We then we'll go back and look at it more closely. Uh, so again, 14 through 20 was about again how the you know this one body consists of uh, consists of uh, the body does not consist of one member, but and that's what went to you know the foot, the eye, the, you know. So, um, so let's look at the footnote. Everyone serves. This is this is a really critical point. Everyone serves a vital and indispensable function in the body of Christ. Everyone. Um, so often people don't think they have, again, it says vital and indispensable. You know, vital, you know, if, if you know if you're unconscious, the first thing to do is check your vitals, signs of life. It's like, so that's, you know, you, you are, it's a, you're a critical part of this. It's not, you know, it's not something uh, insignificant. And so it's so important that, you know, they're recognizing everyone serves a vital an indispensable function uh, in the body of Christ. So we have to remind ourselves of that one, so you don't dismiss yourself as not being, you know, uh, you know, I come, I say my prayers, leave after communion. I don't, I'm not involved at all. You know, I'm, I'm nobody that important or special to be. You don't. I say, it's not just you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what we're missing. When you not, when you're not, you don't see yourself and act as if you're a vital part. You know, they, they can do it. They don't need me. Well, scriptures say, no, we actually, you're a vital, indispensable part. So don't, you know, um, check yourself out. And of course, it's also a challenge for anybody. It's like, you know, sometimes you have people who are very active and, you know, we get very territorial. It's kind of like, oh, new mem new people. Well, I I'll do this. I don't need you. It's like, oh, what do you mean? Vital, indispensable. You know, it's like, you know, actually th that, um you know, that's kind of, you know, so we, this is why we have reminded that. So we do, you know, we don't get territory and think that, well, I'm enough and I'm good enough. You know, it's like, no, every, you know, that uh, we call forth people from the pews, you have a vital role and indispensable role to play. So Paul continues in the footnote, I mean, the uh, footnote continues. As a constituent parts of a body perform different functions and yet work together in harmony. So every member of Christ's body is assigned an important task for the good of the whole. Um, and so, you know, um, let's read that again again. Every member of the Christ body is assigned an important task for the good of the whole. So it seems like the next natural question would be, hmm, what's the important task for me? And you should ask that question. And uh, enough, and hopefully you're curious enough to explore. You know, let me figure this out. Let me discern. Let me talk to someone. Let me, uh, let me, um, you know, seek. You just says seek and you shall find. Then just say sit and you shall find. You know, if you're not moving, I'm not going to find something across the room if I just sit here. So it's like seek and assume. So whether it's your life vocation, you know, or whether it's like what ministry should I be involved in. So we literally had an all day workshop specifically to help people discover, you know, what is the important task that God has assigned. Because if God has called you to do his work, he also is giving you supernatural gifts. We want you to do his supernatural work. He gives you supernatural gifts to carry it out. And that's the whole idea that you receive charisms or gifts from the moment of your baptism. And uh, so if you say, like, you know, um, again, what's the important task? And you notice it says assigned, you know, specifically chosen for you. Um, some Corinthians, the footnote continues, some Corinthians apparently disputed the, right, the validity of certain gifts, a presumptuous attitude that called into question God's wise arrangement of the body, like some parts on that, and, and, and his free distribution of charisms. So I'll say again, again, the, some uh, were, were disputed the validity of certain gifts, a presumptuous attitude that called into question God's wise arrangement of the body and his free uh, distribution of charisms. Okay. Um, yeah, this is just a reflection on um, a script of, of, of Aquinas. Um, let's see. I think I did. Okay. Okay, so specifically, let's look at um, uh, some of the verses. So again, in verse 21 um, is where we read um, uh, you know, 
yeah, the idea that the eye, you know, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Um, so let me see the heads here. In the footnote, Paul visualizes the body as the collective person of Christ with his members compared to anatomical features of the body from top, ears and eyes to bottom, feet. It's also the ears and eyes into the feet. The picture changes somewhat in later Pauline letters where the head represents Christ as distinct from his body, the church. Uh, Ephesians 5, he talks about Jesus, the head, and the church's body. Paul may have developed the illustration over the years, or perhaps he was using the imagery in different ways in different letters. Okay. Um, but clearly, you know, in each of those even times, it's like, you know, again, the idea of the head is the, the one in charge. Uh, you know, if someone says, you know, isn't the Catholics, isn't the Pope the head of the church? No. Like, nope. You know, he's actually called the vicar of Christ, the official title, you know, in the sense, you know, the representative, you know, the one, but he's not the head. You know, Christ is the head. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see. Yeah, okay. And then uh, verse 20, this is again uh, in verse 26, that says, um, you know, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Um, unity, and footnote, unity among believers rules out, um, uh, unity among believers rules out, um, yeah, I just lost my place. Yes, unity among believers rules out indifference toward others and encourages mutual support and compassion among them. Um, but again, the idea of the unity, the idea that um, unity among believers rules out and indifference toward others and encourages mutual support and compassion. What's compassion? Compassion literally means to suffer with. You know, cum with passio, passion to suffer. So literally the idea that something's wrong. I mean, not, if you think about, again, why are people protesting in the world today? It's like, uh, it's like I can't watch people starving to death and and being blown to pieces and not feel anything. There's some people who may not may not feel anything, but compassion is like that it hurts. You know, you know, you can't. You know, if someone's grieving, you know, at, uh, um, grieving the loss of a loved one, you know, and it's like you know that. Uh, you know, when I I remember uh, when I just told the story, it was my first year of priesthood with this person who had was dealing with an amputation. Was wasn't able to take to get 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 pain medicine. It's like you know when I just when he was grabbing my hand so tight and I just grab I just want I how do I communicate I'm with you you're not alone. Compassion means suffer with you know and I literally was squeezing my hand as hard as I could and he was squeezing his hand so it's like you know as a matter of fact someone squeezing your hand as hard as they can and you don't squeeze back they might crush your hand. So it's like but nonetheless it's kind of like. I was just trying to communicate that you're not, you know, that, you know, I see you, you know, um, you know, literally, like, I feel you, uh, you're now by yourself. Um, and that's so literally, again, rather than just allegorically, or, or it's like, when one hurts, we all feel the pain, you know, when one is celebrated, has a, you know, we all celebrate, you know, and again, that's when, if we're not let, if we, what do we do, what if we have jealousy and envy, it's almost like, you know, why are they giving her all that attention? Why do you know that I did? They didn't plot for me, you know. It's gonna, you know, it's like, you know, or something happens. Well, you know, uh, that you know, we're celebrating a person who prayed for the loved one and surgery, and they came out flying colors, and my loved one didn't, you know. And I'm just, you know, for the sake, it's like, so I'm not excited because I didn't get what I knew I wanted. So again, okay, that's not the spirit of Christ. That's clearly the spirit of Christ working. But the idea is that we can, I can, we're free to celebrate something great for you, you know, and we also are impacted that uh, when you're experiencing loss, okay, which moves us to comfort you. So, all right. Um, and so uh, also um, now verse um, 27, 28, you know, now you are the body of Christ, individual members of it. So he's made that clear. And God has appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, then healers, helpers, administrators, speakers in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? 
Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. Okay. Um, and so uh, let's just look at, again, the footnote there, <clears throat> verse 28. Um, yeah, first apostles. Apostleship is given pride of place among the ministerial gifts. This is because the apostles saw Christ risen from the dead, you know, eyewitnesses, uh, and were directly charged by him with spreading the gospel. Um, their mission to lay the initial foundations of the church in the, in the world is essentially unrepeatable. Uh, the idea that, again, we say, you know, hold one, we, we, we believe in one holy Catholic apostolic. The idea is that a faith, a faith based on the foundation of the apostles. They were the first to lay the foundation. Think of it, you know, for living stones, <coughs> you know, um, first thing, you, you know, it's like, you better have a solid foundation. You build on that. And I can always remember years ago when they're building the first convention center in D.C., and I can remember dating myself. It's like, you know, there was literally a tour down, built another one. I saw both of them. But I remember, I remember when they started building the first, it's like, uh, it was like just big hole in the ground. And, you know, and it seemed like, it seemed like months was just a big hole in the ground. I kept thinking, did they, maybe they ran out of money and they couldn't finish it, whatever. And then one day I drove by and it's like the whole skeleton frame was upset. But well, that was, that was quick, you know? And after that, it's like, it went up very quickly. But, you know, why is this like, if, if this building is going to work, Make sure it's a solid foundation. Okay, so that's where the, all the energy went. Um, you know, that's that's one of my speeches when I do like marriage prep. It's kind of like you know, okay, Father, how, you know, how long is this preparation gonna take? Like, how long you gonna be married? You know, <laughs> you know, it's like you want forever, did plan for forever. You know, so you got to take time to make sure you have a strong foundation that's gonna last the next fifty years. Because if you skip on the foundation, it ain't gonna last. It's very unlikely to last. It's like because it's just. Life gets tough and heavy, and it eventually collapses. So, um, so but the idea so founded on the apostles, you know. So I was really apostolic it was because like because they were the ones who ate and drank and walked with them. They were the eyewitnesses, testimonies. You know, we said, oh yeah, be a witness. Well, this is all, you know. Um, so that's the idea of apostolic. It's the first again, pride of place. Um, again, the footnote says again their mission to lay the initial foundations of the church in the world. Is essentially unrepeatable. Okay, um, their work of teaching and sanctifying the world, however, is carried on by their successors, the bishops. Um, actually, I don't have that note. <clears throat> All right, so um, in uh, now thirty-one again, uh, we kind of get a, it. Says that the, uh, this is read a footnote. It says Paul prepares readers for the following exposition of God's greatest gifts. Um, and uh, the virtues of faith, hope, and love. So again, that verse, uh, 31, earnestly desire the higher gifts. This also gets us into, we'll get into the whole thing of why there's not an, this grand in, um, emphasis on the speaking of tongues, that, that particular gift. Um, but I'm sure those, again, who did the calling to get to workshop probably recognize some of those things that, that Paul mentions. You know, um, again, uh, apostles and, uh, prophets, teachers, workers uh, uh, of miracles, healers, helpers, administrators. Um, okay, so seems, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Okay, um, and this is when we get to chapter 13. The way of love. Um, so again, this is Paul. If I speak in the tongues of men, interesting, that's the very first one he mentions of all the gifts. Again, he's kind of making his, you know, if I speak in the tongues of men, which is apparently something very popular in uh, excited folks in Corinth. Uh, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, 
but rejoicing in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. But now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part, now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, love, abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Not tongues. <laughs> uh, maybe just uh, actually uh, just again the footnote. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one to thirteen, which we just read, um, ch in chapter yeah, well yeah, chapter thirteen. Uh, and it says uh, a poetic interlude on love that summarizes Paul's moral instruction in the letter. Um, I'm curious what that foot, that reference is. Sixteen to sixteen, fourteen. Does it say it's uh, yeah, in in, in uh, sixteen fourteen it says let all let all you do be done in love. Again, this primacy of love. Um, so let's go to get the footnote again. Um, uh, chapter 13 is a poetic interlude on love that summarizes Paul's instructions, more instructions in the letter, and stands as the centerpiece of his teaching on spiritual gifts. And it's going back to a question about the tongues. It's like he mentions all these different gifts, you know, but clearly love is the centerpiece of his teaching on spiritual gifts. Because some in Corinth esteemed more spectacular charisms like tongues, Paul writes to temper their charismatic ent enthusiasm by insisting that charity must inspire and direct the exercise of ministerial gifts. Without love, the other charisms bring no benefit to the body of Christ and may even cause divisions among its members. Um, so again, you know, so Paul writes to temper their charismatic enthusiasm, enthusiasm by insisting that charity must inspire and direct the exercise of all ministerial gifts. Um, I actually did not look this up, but I'm curious to what uh, Catechism 800 has to say. Um, yeah, charisms. Um, It says in uh, paragraph 800 in, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. That's when you see CCC, Catechism of the Catholic Church. Charisms are to be accepted with gratitude by the person who receives them and by all members of the church as well. They are wonderfully rich grace for the apostolic vitality and for the holiness of the entire body of Christ, provided they really are genuine gifts of the Holy Spirit and are used in full conformity with authentic promptings of the of this spirit that is in keeping with charity the true treasure of all charisms okay um again i remember that line from uh, augustine um you know in essential things unity and non-essential things liberty freedom maybe yeah you know uh but in all things charity okay essential things unity uh in in non-essential things liberty but in all things charity um, of course, we can never hear that enough. That's our, you know, again, you think of uh, when Jesus said, uh, yeah, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I loved you. Okay. Um, okay, just a few minutes. Um, and maybe just kind of break down some of these. We can begin. Um, uh, again, also, you know, okay, I won't go there. So first, uh, 13.1, again, uh, it talks about, you know, use the term, a clang. if I have, if I can speak in tongues, and like men and angels, I'm just a noisy clown. He says, you know, a noisy, um, a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. Uh, just that image, um, again, a clanging symbol, possibly an illusion, this is a footnote, to ecstatic pagan worship. Speaking in tongues can produce the same meaningless noise if its purpose is thwarted by failure. To... Meaningless noise. You know, that could be singing. 
preaching. I mean, the idea is like in the end, if love is absent, uh, so um, ver and then uh, and then uh, verse two again, he says, "I am nothing." Knowledge of saving mysteries, because he first talks about speaking tongues and about great knowledge and understanding. Knowledge of saving mysteries and the exercise of extraordinary faith amount to nothing unless coupled with activity. Uh, with, I'm sorry, with active charity toward others. Um, so the business of some believe faith alone is sufficient for salvation. Others believe that they will be saved by Christ's sacraments alone. Others rely on works of mercy alone and think they can sin with impunity. Such people fail to understand that nothing avails without charity. That's a commentary by St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, he continues, though, verse three again, I, if I deliver my body to be burned, um, a reference to martyrdom by fire. Uh, remember Daniel 3, you know, the, the fiery furnace? If I get my body to be burned, even such heroic acts are profitless toward eternal life without a supernatural love for God. Um, even such heroic acts are profitless without a toward, toward eternal life without a supernatural love for God. Um, again, in, um, in four to seven, again, the whole, you know, love is patient, love is kind. One, by the way, I have to say this before I forget, just also, when you ask, if you ask the average person, uh, in a word, you know, what, what's one word again, word association, love, what, 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 would, you, what would you say? Well, what the scriptures say is, is, and I don't think by accident, I'm sure not by accident, it's like, first definition, patient, you know? Actually, you probably find it helpful if you actually start to find it that way yourself. It's like, you know, you know, boy, you know, you're trying my patience. What does that mean? Trying your love. Yeah. It's like, okay, so what are you going to do? It's like, you know, you know, she's a Lord, give me patience. It's like, I need more love. Um, but uh, love, you know, so, but the idea that seeing it, because it's like, man, I, I just, oh man, this requires so much patience to do this task where they help this person who's maybe disabled or whatever. It's kind of like, yep, requires a lot of love. You know, oh, this person at work gets on my last nerve, you know, mm -hmm. but they mean well, they're not just vicious, but it's kind of like, oh, it's like, they need your love. Yep, they need your love. Mm -hmm. So when you start, start to start, whenever you use the term patience, change it to love and see it, it gives you a different perspective, you know? And that's why, here's a, well, let me put it in, in this way. You know, First John says, God is love. And I'm really happy about that. God is patience. So thank you, Lord, for being patient with me. I'm slow to learn sometimes. It's like, I'm glad God is patient. You know, elsewhere, scripture says, yeah, God's patience is geared to your salvation. You know, you give me more time. You give me another chance. So it's like, but think just, just this is a simple act to yourself. Think of whenever you use the term patience, turn it to love and see what happens. I change your perspective. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, and again, again, live my body to be burned. Okay. And again, yeah, four to seven, Paul personifies love to explain its true nature and greatness because love or charity is a virtue that is supernatural and God given. It cannot be reduced to a feeling or emotion that comes and goes over time. And if it says that love cannot be reduced, not true love, cannot be reduced to a feeling or an emotion that comes and goes over time. I'll use an example, uh, say, you know, that, you know, they say, you know, they're having a rough time relationship, you know, and maybe, maybe it's time to end it, you know, or let's say even a marriage, you know, it's like, I remember back when we fell in love and things were wonderful and everything. And then, I don't know, one day we realized, you know, we, we fell out of love. And I remember, and I remember, so I was like, you know, I think I figured out your problem. I'm like, really? You sound both sound really clumsy. Do a lot of falling. You know, it's kind of like it was just, you know, went out one day. It's like, oops, I fell in love. Wow, I didn't plan on that. I just didn't see that coming. And then we kind of went along and ran, you know, you know, rode that ride for a while. And it's like, and it's like, and then we fell out of love. It's like, was there a choice at any point in any of this? It's just like it was an accident. We fell in, we fell out, and it's like. That's not love, you know? It's like, you know, you can't reduce it to just, you know, a feeling or an emotion. Love is a person. Love is a choice, okay? That's what makes it special. We say God so loved the world, it's like, he had a choice. 
You know, he did all that just for me. It's like he had a choice. If he didn't have a choice, there's nothing virtuous about it. Oh, you were forced to do it. You didn't have a choice. You didn't want to do it. They dragged you. It's like, well, that's not love. Okay. But the fact is, you were willing to sacrifice all that and didn't have to. You know, but that's also for us. How do we prove, demonstrate love most clearly? It's like sacrifice. You know, man, it cost you something and you stuck around. You paid the price. Wow, I'm humble. You know, clearly, I guess you really do care about. Me. Okay, so we'll stop on that. So we'll be on time. And um, let's pray. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, uh, Lord, just reminding us um, of the supremacy of love over all virtues. Uh, Lord God, may we always keep that in mind as we, even even when we serve you and serve others, Lord God, uh, you know, we have, as you've given us the charisms and the gifts, uh, may we always uh, uh, make sure they are uh, consistent and, and true to the call to love one another. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your love for us, you know, because, Lord, we thank you that you are patient and you are kind, that you're not jealous or boastful, that you're not arrogant or rude, that you don't insist on your own way, uh, in a, in a, a, that you, you truly honor our will and our freedom. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, that you are not resentful. Uh, that you don't rejoice in the wrong, and that you do rejoice in what is right. Lord, we thank you that you bear all things, believe all things, and hope all things, and endure all things. Lord, we thank you that you never fail us. Uh, may we keep that in the center of our hearts and minds as we rest tonight. As you're waking us up tomorrow, be it your will. We'll serve you throughout another day through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. Good night, Father. Good night. Good night, Father. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Thank you, Good night, Father. Everyone. Thank you, Father. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Thank you all. Take care. Have a good night. Hey, <laughs>